Welcome to another moment in the Word. We're looking now at the last paragraph of chapter 2 in the Gospel of Matthew. It's uh, verse 19 that we'll start. I hope you have your Bibles opened, and if you do, then you can read with me and uh, also meditate with me. And if you don't, you can get your Bible later on and then replay this. Well, it begins, verse 19. Behold, when Herod was dead, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead who sought the young child. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside to go into parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's look at the very beginning. It begins with but. The but is a contrast, obviously, to what went before. What did happen before? It begins with Herod being uh, aware that uh, the wise men had not come back, that perhaps they uh, saw his uh, devices, they understood his connivings, and uh, they warned then the family. He has no idea, but they didn't come back. He was humiliated by them not coming back, and he was angry, and he kills the babies that are in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. It is the but which is a contrast. There is always, no matter what is going on in the world, no matter how horrific it may be, no matter how evil it may be, there's a but. And the but is where God is involved. And so we see it here, but when Herod was dead... Now, there is a lot that Josephus writes. Remember, Josephus is a Jewish general in the Roman Empire. He is writing a history of the Jews, but it is also giving you inside information about what is happening in the empire. He tells about Herod's death in great detail. The detail is actually gross. He describes how worms are eating, how gangrene has taken over, how even the smell, which gives you the idea that Josephus has firsthand information, but how Herod dies. This evil man, there's a but because he perpetrates evil, but he will feel pain. And tragically for him, he is continuing to feel the pain, for the worm dies not. And in the, the flames of hell, he is feeling the pain forever of what he did here on earth. What a but this is. Herod dies. The angel of the Lord, and it's not the angel, it's an, an angel, it's a messenger from God, appears to Joseph now in a dream. It's interesting how many times we find Joseph mentioned before this. When some would think Joseph is a hidden character in the Christmas story, the truth of the matter is God had appeared to him when Mary was first known to be pregnant and says, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. He communicates that through an angel in a dream. We find later on that he is in Galilee and he is told to, uh, to, to go to Bethlehem by the Roman Empire. But when he's in Bethlehem and he, is to, he discovers the, the Herods and his plans, it's not because of what Joseph discovered. It is what the angel and angel of the Lord said to Joseph when he was in Bethlehem, go to Egypt. And now he's in Egypt and an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. It's interesting. God doesn't always appear in a dream to the uh, shepherds that were in the field. God spoke very directly while they were awake, and he used 
angel and a host of angels to communicate to those shepherds. God is able to communicate to you in various ways. Let me assure you, however, it will never contradict the word of God. So if you believe that there is a message that God has communicated to you in a dream, be aware of the fact it must also agree with the word of God. This angel is communicating from heaven, from God, through a dream, what Joseph needs to hear. And that is, arise. The word arise means just like he was in Bethlehem, you need to leave, you need to leave now. And the same is true here. Herod dies, but it's not because Herod dies that Joseph leaves. He leaves because an angel of the Lord had told him. God had told him specifically. Notice that each time you see Joseph's obedience. He is instantly obedient. He is told to arise, take the young child. Now Jesus is approximately four years of age. We know because of the death of Herod and when it occurred. And he went then into the land of Israel. Notice it is called the land of Israel. It is not the land of Judah because it is more than Judah, which is the southern part of the whole of Israel. This is referring also to Galilee. It is what we now call today the land of Israel, though we would divide it into various parts. And so he is, then we find in verse 21, he arose. He was told to arise, he arose. Is that true for you and for me? When God tells us, do we instantly obey or we do, do we dally? Do we deliberate? Do we try to figure out, well, maybe God wants something else. I'll wait. I'll ask for a sign. No, Joseph didn't ask for signs. He immediately responded and obeyed and did, and you'll see the exact language, took the young child and his mother. You will see that the same words, almost, well, they are identical, in the Greek even, in the Septuagint, referring to Moses and how Moses left and was saved, and those same words. Now he goes into the land of Israel, but when he is coming into the land of Israel, he hears, though Herod has died, Archelaus. Archelaus is the oldest son of Herod. He hears that Archelaus reigns in Judea, and he's afraid, therefore, to go there. Well, there's just reason, because Archelaus is no different than Herod. Herod, who killed just for the sport of it, and now you have Archelaus. It's Passover, and Passover is a time, of course, of high holy, it's a high holy day. It is a day of great remembrance of the blood applied to the doorpost and how the death angel would pass over any place where the, um, the blood was applied, the blood of the lamb. And now it's at Passover, and what do you have? Well, there are some of the Jews that are speaking to one another in protest of Archelaus's behavior. And what does he do? He kills 3,000 of the Jewish people. And so consequently, there is great fear in Judea. That's the southern part of Israel. And as we look, Joseph then is told, and notice what happens. It's the end of verse 22. Being warned of God in a dream, he turns aside. So God speaks to us in our fears where you may be going through great fear right now. Fear is mentioned, or anxiety, or cares, is mentioned more than 1,600 times in the Bible. It's mentioned more than any other emotion. And God speaks to us in our fears. In fact, you'll find 365 times it mentioned, fear not. God is telling us, don't fear, and it's in our fears, and there's just cause for our fears, but look beyond your fears and see the God who is greater than your circumstances that cause you to fear. 
And so consequently, he turns aside to go to parts of Galilee. Galilee is the northern part of Israel. It's where you see the Sea of Galilee. But Galilee was despised by Jewish people. It was called the Galilee of the nations or of the Goya. It was the, 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 the place where you would have those who were non-Jewish, Gentiles also occupying this area. It was a despised area. Judea was where Jerusalem was. That is where you have the Orthodox of Judaism. But here you find, no, it's more the Reformed, the Conservative, that you would find in the northern part of, Ge of Israel. And he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth, if you were to look at the Sea of Galilee, you would go about 14 miles inland, and then you would see it's right across from uh, Megiddo, and where it is on the valley of Megiddo called Armageddon. And so consequently, this is the location. It is a high city, and therefore Jesus later on will say, a city set on a hill can not, it will shine its light. And therefore you can see Nazareth, this was on a hill. Remember, this is where they despise Jesus after he gives his message that the day has come in which comfort has come to the nation of Israel because Messiah is here. And they wanted to throw him off a cliff. The cliff is a huge precipice. And this is where the hill is. This is Nazareth. But Nazareth, it's a despised city. It was so despised, it was despised even among the, um, the other Galileans. It was Nathaniel that says to Philip, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? It, it was a city that was considered punk, Punksville. It was Podunk. It was the place where it, it was despised even among others. It's not mentioned at all in the writings of Josephus. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. It, it's not mentioned in any of the Jewish writings. It is a very small city. It's estimated by archaeologists that at the time of Jesus, it only had 500 people that populated the city. So he goes to Nazareth, and therefore he shall be called a Nazarene. But I want you to look at the word na Nazar, or na the, the root word for Nazareth. It comes possibly from two things, and the Nizer is the one which is translated to be a branch. And Jesus is referred to in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, because we know he will bring righteousness upon the earth as the waters that cover the sea. It's referring to Messiah, that he shall be a branch out of the root of Jesse, that he will be like a twig, a sapling. There would be no obvious uh, attributions that would be given to him. And we find in Isaiah... There was no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. But we find that he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was familiar with suffering like one who men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Nazareth not only means a twig, and also a comfort. It was a despised city. Jesus identifies with those that are despised and rejected. He identifies with you. Isn't it interesting that Pilate had the inscription placed on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, of the place that was despised, King king of the Jews and king for you because he was humiliated and despised, rejected, so that you might be accepted in the beloved, so that you might know the Lord. I pray today 
as you have meditated on this passage with me, and by the way, there's so much more, that you find yourself, that you have nothing that you can be proud of, obviously, that your greatest achievements, Peter, Paul says, I count them as dung, that I identify with the Nazarene, that I am willing to be humbled and to serve like he served me, because he has made us a kingdom of priests. Father, we thank you so much that he who was God, who is God, became and made himself of no reputation, that he might redeem us. And therefore, Father, he has given a name that's above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. We pray, Father, that that's true for everyone listening now, that we all bow our knee, we all bow our hearts, we all prostrate ourselves before you, because you have given us your Son. We acknowledge, Father, our sinfulness. We acknowledge our failures. And we acknowledge that we are of no worth apart from you. Bless, Father, each that are hearing. In Jesus' name, amen.